I interviewed the creator of Vita Carnis, Darian Quilloy, and we had a pretty interesting conversation. We talked about a lot of his experiences creating the first season of Vita Carnis, and he may have let a thing or two slip about what to expect from next season. Let's get into it. Hey, Darian, how you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on here. I have quite a few questions here, I'll admit. Um, the first is just, what was the earliest idea that you had for the series? Was it like a particular monster or did the idea just kind of like come together as a whole, you know? Um, I'd say a few years ago, I had this idea for a story and I just didn't really have a, like a medium to put it out in. It was just a fun okay. little idea in my head just bouncing around mm -hmm. and then one day i discovered what unfiction was and was introduced to analog horror via the mandela catalog nice yeah because was one day i saw an uh, artist i follow post some fan art and i'm like "Ooh, what's this <laughs> that's spooky <laughs> that's spooky i should go check it out and then i did and i instantly fell in love and i'm like mm. I yeah wonder if i could do this uh-huh yeah and then it just kind of grew from there that's awesome. What are some of the biggest inspirations for the series, like aesthetically, and then also narratively? Like, you know, what kind of stories inspired you uh, as you were kind of constructing everything, planning it out? Uh, so for the for the basic visual stuff, a bunch of Trevor Henderson's work, yeah. where he takes mm -hmm. photos and draws a little creature or a monster hidden in the background or somewhere. Yeah was one of the biggest inspirations I had. I, I was just going to say, that's, uh, I think, especially evident in, like, all of the insert images throughout the documentary. Um, like, especially the... For some reason to me, the meat snake ones are the ones that, like, really stood out to me the most out of the documentary. Yeah. And for the basic, basic storytelling stuff. It was other pieces of analog horror, like of course Mandela Catalog and Local 58. And for the practical stuff, uh, I was accidentally, I didn't know it was analog horror or unfiction. Uh, Daisy Brown. Yeah, yeah. I, honestly, I never made that connection but like now that you mention it i'm like oh okay yeah <laughs> yeah you can definitely see that just throughout the series i'll probably put some some images up of like screenshots from that series so that people can kind of see what you're talking about um i don't know if it's if people are as familiar with that series these days but like when you look at it it's like okay uh, yeah i can see it yeah, I remember watching it when it was like pretty early and it was just kind of new. I just saw it in my like recommended. I'm like, whoa, what is that? And then I discovered like a, later a few years that I had some like hidden stuff. And I'm like, oh, wait, there's an actual story here. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's some pretty cool stuff. And like it definitely is to me one of the things that really sets uh, Vita Carnes apart from most of the other analog horror on YouTube is the the practical effects. Um, that's all just like it. It's the you're sitting there watching through it, and you get so immersed in the story that you almost don't notice it immediately. And then after a second, you're like, "Oh, oh, I'm really looking at this. This isn't like some CGI thing or." something that's been composited in that like, like that's actually there yeah when I, I like when the videos first came out and people were talking about it there were a bunch of comments asking if it was cgi or if it was real mm -hmm. and a funny thing is there were so many comments that were like i i completely thought it was cgi at first but then when that face popped up i mm -hmm. knew immediately it was real yeah yeah it, it is super super cool i think the thing that like first made me be like like the very first moment of being like okay this is something that's really unique was just seeing like the actual fingers of the mimic come around the door like that in my opinion is like the smallest little detail that sells that whole scene and it's such a cool part of the series to me like I, I i really love it when there are like 
you know, these very granular moments in a series that just elevate the the story and like the tone of it. Yeah, like the specific planning that was put into that specific scene, like it wasn't too complicated. I was just like, okay, so what are some subtle things that I could do to slowly build up the reveal of the mimic? Mm -hmm. And like first it started out with like the introduction, like all adult mimics only eat human flesh. flesh. Yeah, and that pause. Uh, <laughs> yep, give it a sec, let it register in the brain, mm -hmm. and then we slowly learn a little bit more, and then that knocking scene. Yeah. And catches people <laughs> off guard. Yeah, a funny a funny part of that. Um, so I did like a, a live stream to, you know, kind of come together as a community to, to watch Facility Zero when it premiered. And uh, before it, it was, uh, someone came into the chat and they were like, hey, you should check out um, Mandela Catalyst. And that one also has a knock. And then the next thing that we watched immediately after that was the mimic video, like getting caught up on some stuff. And I was like, are you serious? Like twice in a row? <laughs> Double win. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. The, the knock is another thing that just like, it like sucks you into the story. Yeah. Like just the little things help push the story along. And since I started the series a while ago, I've slowly been implementing more and more little things here and there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm very glad that I've slowly learned and adjusted my style along as these videos have come out and people have helped me in the comments or any other recommendations people have made. Yeah, uh, it's been the first episode came out a little over a year ago now, right? Yeah, almost exactly a year. It was in that's awesome. end of April last year. Wow. Yeah, dude, that's super cool. Just that you've been able to put it out for this long. And like for me to the idea of working on like a single project that's growing over that time frame is a little bit like unfathomable. Having like graduated from school recently, I'm like, what do you mean that like you can work on a project for more than like three months at a time, you know? <laughs> Originally, it wasn't supposed to be like that big of a thing. Like, yeah. It was just like, oh, a fun little story I can post on YouTube. Uh -huh. And then around of December, January this year, it popped off and started uh -huh. <laughs> gaining huge traction. And I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, I got to put more detail into this now. Uh huh. Yeah. Out of curiosity, um, how did the increase in uh, viewership from Vita Carnis translate into like people, you know, getting more eyes onto your your digital art and uh, you know your other work? I would say it was a pretty good um, boost, especially on Instagram, which is my main platform. Yeah, mm -hmm. like I was fairly small. I was slowly growing and just like only gaining followers and traction via posts of pictures and drawings. But then with YouTube, it's like people started making connection. They're like, oh, you're this guy. Yeah. Uh -huh. I had a bunch of like <laughs> mutuals realize like, wait, you're the guy who made Vita Carnage. That's so funny. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Your, your, uh, your work has a, a pretty unique wet look to it. <laughs> so yes. you can, you can Meaty, see the connections. Fleshy goodness. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, how much of a, a solo act was uh, season one? Did you like actually make all of the puppets and costumes and props yourself? Pretty much everything was just done by me. Wow. Uh, besides That's the voice actors, impressive. <laughs> yeah, besides the voice actors and the few other actors that were shown in person, everything mm -hmm. was done by me that I had to learn by scratch. Like yeah. when I first started, editing was brand new to me. Oh, wow. Uh, crafting, like making the props and such. I had a little bit of experience beforehand, but other than that, mm -hmm. not really. Yeah. And then 3D modeling for like the later stuff. Yeah. I also had to pretty much learn that from scratch because mm -hmm. I've never used Blender before. How long have you been working on like building up that skill specifically? I was curious about uh, that. Blender? Yeah um it was like in the video message i worked on just a little bit for the pictures 
Oh, but, dude, that was and, all done in Blender? Uh, yeah, the monolith stuff was oh, done in Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. And the finale was almost entirely... Uh-huh. Yeah. Which was a big task to put on. Oh, I'm I was sure. <laughs> a little concerned because it has been a few months since I last uploaded. I'm like, oh, oh, people are thinking that I'm gone. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, I, I think that at, at least for the people who were really like tuned into things and like you know the the diehard fans i think you did a good job of kind of building up the hype because like it certainly for a lot of us felt like a big event message answered a lot of questions but also generated a ton and so facility zero is like oh man how much more are we gonna learn and we learned some pretty massive stuff indeed one uh, thing that I particularly liked was your posting all of the high res renders of the uh, the carnies onto your YouTube community page leading up to it. And then getting that announcement of like when the thing was going up with the final one that we hadn't gotten, the drawing of the singularity, that was dope. <laughs> That was such originally a- like with the community post. I was just going to post one like every so often, and then when mm-hmm. the video came out, I would like post a bunch and then post like, "Hey, the video's out now." Mm-hmm. But the video took so much longer than expected that I'm like, "Oh, I'm going to have to finish before the finale part comes out mm-hmm. for the final picture." So yeah, that was an f- interesting little snippet of detail. One of the things that I know a lot of people were are really interested in is knowing that you did make all of the like the, the props and everything yourself and you actually handled the all of the practical effects yourself how did you go about creating a lot of the stuff like i think specifically the the trimming puppet is one of the things that was really just like brought the series to life yeah the trimming was made via like paper mache and <laughs> silicone and paint with nice. some and i i believe i used a stapler remover for the mouth that made it move oh nice there's just a bunch of random household objects that i had lying around that's with cool some glue and paint that's yeah. super cool did you do have to do any like creating molds or anything i haven't ever actually worked with paper mache before i don't think so i have not gotcha. yet I I always laugh a little bit going into that video because one of the things that the trimming always reminds me of is like a roast turkey. <laughs> I don't know if you get that. Like if you can see that at all with it. I, I see it. Yeah. Like I was joking in the live stream. I was like, oh yeah, you know, the hell turkey. <laughs> <laughs> but how about the uh, the mimic? The That um, one the I puppy? took a styrofoam head that people like put like wigs oh and yeah on. yeah uh-huh and i just slathered a bunch more paper mache on that and used some ping pong balls for the eyes oh nice <laughs> i'd say the only real like practical element that i put into it was i got some plastic online that melts in hot water ah, it's called cool. polymorph plastic i believe yeah where you just melt it down and i just made it into teeth and then just shoved it into the, the head of the <laughs> yeah. mimic uh-huh I guess since it's styrofoam, you just kind of ram it in there. <laughs> Bop. Yeah. Um, this was a, a big one that I, I thought of kind of late when I was writing up the questions, but were there any ideas for carnies that didn't make it into the final series? There were a few, but I can't really talk about that because that hasn't happened yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. Um, there is like a few ideas that I had put on the back burner, but I'm like, nah, that wouldn't that wouldn't fit, or like, I'm oh, nah, that's too cliche, and it's been yeah. done before. Uh-huh. I don't want to create things that Other. already happened and such. Yeah, like uh-huh. I want to try to make something new. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's a, a big part of the appeal of the series is that it does feel very fresh. It's like, you know, at least on the the face of things, it's not just like, oh, it's you know, I guess it's demons again. Uh, um, it's like it's aliens. They're unfortunately though, it's it's kind of hard to do that. Like you always fall into a little bit of the cliche. Uh huh. Yeah. For example, like the mimic. The the way that you've constructed things though, 
you've created an opportunity for the series to appeal to a lot of different people because it's like, okay, there is the mimic, but like, I think a lot of other people, if they were, you know, handling the series, they would have been like, okay, mimics, that's it. That's the monster. But you kind of have a unique skill set from your, your background working in like body horror art to be like, okay, I'm going to make seven or eight different things. And eight. yeah, yes, eight. Um, and they're all going to be really interesting and things that like somebody who's coming into the series looking for something different is still going to be able to latch on to and you know i don't want to i don't want to say identify with but you know like i said they, they yeah. can they can become endeared to it like some people i know that you've seen like some people come to the series because they really like the fact that there's like the trimmings and the meat snakes who are just kind of vibing in the background they're just um, normal little dudes. Yeah, the little dudes. And then a lot of people come to it because they do enjoy the more typical horror experience that the mimics bring. Um, and then there are people who are, I guess probably I would fall more into the camp of like, I really like all of the stuff with the singularity and the host where it's like more conspiracy type stuff and the kind of like cosmic horror element that the the singularity seems to bring to things and so you've kind of got different monsters that can ap appeal to everybody and i think that's one of the biggest strengths of the series and part of why it, it has popped off like it has it like for example like the mimic i tried to do like not just a creature that tries to replace you and steals mm -hmm. your identity yeah it's more of an animal that tries to use human faces as camouflage rather than stealing people's like it's a blending tactic rather than mm -hmm. a scary factor yeah uh-huh and it, it is cool how that like gets more into the animal kingdom inspirations for things and that whole speculative biology aspect of the series what kind of brought that idea about because like that's that is another thing that i found just ridiculously interesting going through it because um, I don't know if you've ever played the Monster Hunter games before. It kind of is like horror Monster Hunter where it's like, oh, we're going to design this whole ecosystem, but this time it's it's spooky. <laughs> I have not played Monster Hunter before, no. The Vita Carnus creatures themselves were very much inspired by real life animals mm -hmm. and some of their behaviors. Somebody coming into the series, they're like, oh, well, I don't know what this weird little like meatball thing is with legs <laughs> um but i know what raccoons do so i kind of yeah. get their whole thing as well and so that like makes things more approachable in a way one thing i was curious about is uh would you ever be open to putting your creatures into other properties like i know that at some point a community member drew up a concept for putting the mimic into dead by daylight would you ever be open to something like that um maybe but if i do that I'd first like to have the finish, like the series finish yeah, first. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that it's not just like. Is it's kind of weird to put like something that isn't done mm -hmm. into other media. Yeah. Like unless it's like exploring a different thing. But if it's just like mm, here, uh -huh. then it, I don't know. It just feels weird. Yeah, that makes sense. When the first episode came out, how far ahead had you planned at that point? Did you have the whole first season planned out? Did you have the entire series or kind of just like the documentary? Um, it was mostly I had planned season one and season three. Uh -huh. <laughs> season two sense. was a bit more of a, a more of a detailed covering mm -hmm. uh, season, which will help things along much better really experienced authors that I've listened to will talk about how like the middle of a story is almost always the hardest part to get right um, and the hardest part to plan out. So that that makes a lot of sense. It's like, you know where you're going to start out and you know where things are going to end up and you kind of have to like get into it a little bit to figure out how you're going to get from it's an point experience. A to point B. Yeah. Like experiencing it helps things go along. 
Yeah. Because originally I didn't have too much planned. I had like a little thing here and there in season mm-hmm. one, season two. But then once I started making the videos themselves and then more and more detail was covered, I'm like, oh, okay. So if I do this and this, and if I do this, then it'll be much better. Mm-hmm. Uh, did someone actually end up eating the cheesy craw penne after you stopped filming? And if so, how was it? I did. You did? It was, deli- <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> yeah. The filming of it was at one in the morning. <laughs> I don't know why I decided to do it then. <laughs> it was just a bad time. Oh my god! And then after like several takes of it, just like some things not working, some things I'm like, eh, good enough. Uh huh. I sat down. I'm like, oh, I'm not putting this to waste. Yeah. You have to eat the cursed hamburger helper. It was fairly <laughs> dry, though. I definitely should have added a sauce or something. Yeah. Uh-huh. The um, the flavor enhancer didn't help. <laughs> oh, it helps. Don't worry. It helps a lot. <laughs> I'm, I am super curious to know what the flavor enhancer actually was. Kind of almost looked like popcorn salt or something. You have it pretty much spot on (laughs) so like the first um container of flavor enhancer Mm -hmm. was buffalo flavored seasoning for popcorn hey yeah (laughs) i'm a little bit disturbed by the fact that i was able to identify it with that (laughs) with that much clarity (laughs) that was perfect uh i gotta go i gotta go rethink some things (laughs) <laughs> yeah the second batch was um turmeric powder that uh, i found at like a store yeah like, mm, this looks well and i can buy in bulk <laughs> unfortunately turmeric powder by itself does not taste good. <laughs> you did because i ate all the food in that Dude. video too <laughs> except yeah. the piece of bread that bread was long gone oh my gosh i was like i was about to say i i could not imagine being able to get that down if it was literally just a piece of bread with a bunch of turmeric powder on it. Oh, it was it was so bad. <laughs> I can imagine. Is there any particular in-world meaning to the way that the carnies are ordered in the series? Or is it just the way that you thought was most interesting for the audience? Uh, they're ordered that way for a reason. Okay, cool. I was like, I was thinking about it earlier. I'm like, okay, we've got this whole sequence that's repeating and I don't really know why it would stop in the second season. I kind of, you know, I kind of expected it to continue into the second season. Um, just it because most likely will, it, but it might be a little like jambled up, Uh huh. but yeah, I'm going to try to keep that structure going. It's a good structure. I mean, it, it helps people to stay oriented in the series and it makes it interesting to like, like in the first season, I think the reason people were able to identify with some certainty that like flavor enhancer is host spores is because of the fact that it's like, it lines up, it lines up with a documentary. Yep. It's uh, like, Hey, this episode's supposed to be about the host, but it's a commercial <laughs> for flavor enhancer. Uh-huh. Mm. Yeah. That's that one's honestly probably one of my favorites out of the series. <laughs> it's so that, that's another thing that I really just loved about it was the fact that um, all of the episodes feel like they're not just made for the viewers. They feel like they're made for the people in the world. They are supposed to serve some purpose um, beyond just being like, hey, I found a VHS tape and it has this stuff that's got a story in it and you can piece it all together through YouTube. It's like, this one's a commercial. This one's a guide for people who are looking at owning a horrific little pet um a little meat thing (laughs) yeah um and like here's a cooking tutorial yeah that one it's so weird (laughs) that there's an analog horror series that's got a cooking show in it and it works really (laughs) well and it like when you're going through it it's like oh i see how this fits in it's awesome (laughs) what criticism are you most tired of getting um i'm not really tired of criticism because you can learn from anything but Mm -hmm. i'd say the one i'm most tired of is the like the one that's most repeated which is like 
oh, this this thing here was spelt wrong. And I'm like, I gotcha. know. It haunts me. <laughs> yeah. I understand. <laughs> yeah. I didn't use spell check. I get it. Mm -hmm. People are like, you should have used spell check on that. I'm like, oh, I know. Hey, you got this part backwards. Yep, I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, still, it's useful criticism. Yeah. I almost e expected it to be something along the lines of people who are like, hey, this thing's inconsistent. Why did you make it inconsistent? That's bad. Oh yeah, that one. <laughs> like, like, especially with the mimic. Uh -huh. uh, like I, it said that mimics were invulnerable in the first one, and uh -huh. yet this one it says you can. Why is that? Yeah. It's almost as if it was done on purpose. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I started watching it. I think very shortly after Message had been released. I think it was the week that Message came out. And I was going through and I like, you know, started looking through the comments and I got to that one and I'm like, the, I feel like this is intentional. Like, why are people thinking that this is like just a production error? I'm like, there's a lot of it, stuff it in this. A, it was a retcon. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff in this that like seems like it could be production errors that are pretty clearly not production errors. The most glaring one's probably the mimics. The next one is definitely like, you know where there's that island in hudson bay that's just water in the real world and like all the little map discrepancies and stuff like that like you could chalk it up to like carelessness but it's more like like carefulness that's being very intentional Chekhov's gun and all that yeah pretty much yeah now darian i need you to answer a very serious question for me can you be serious with me for a second I can be serious. Okay. What is your question? Let's be serious. Mimic waifus, yes or no? Nah. Well, guess who won't be covering season two when it comes out? <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably still cover it. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty disappointed. Oh, no, man. Seems pretty unwatchable now. <laughs> Dude. There are a lot of people who are just a little a little too into the the carnies in that way and you see them in the comments quite a bit. I don't I don't find the the meatballs particularly uh, attractive, but I guess to each their own. <laughs> just ignore it. It's the internet. Don't it's... talk about it. If you don't talk about it, it'll go away. I probably have made this issue worse for you by by mentioning it here, but oh well. That's your problem. <laughs> are there any fan theories that you liked so much that you made them canon um really well i do enjoy a lot of fan theories but mm -hmm. most of the like this entire story is almost pretty much entirely written yeah mm -hmm. so that's definitely everything's happening everything's leading up to a thing mm -hmm. like maybe like a tiny detail like a suggestion for like a cool thing that could happen yeah, I'd be like, oh, okay, I'll I'll include that. Mm -hmm. But like big plot elements, not nah, everything's already been written, unfortunately. Yeah, gotcha. Um, in the face of the success of Vita Carnus, it seems like it would be really easy to just pour all of your energy into a single project. Um, how do you balance your work as a digital artist and a YouTuber so that you can kind of like keep, you know, both of those passions alive, uh, even when you've got more than one iron in the fire? Uh, it's mostly about like taking your breaks and mm -hmm. not like stressing too much on one thing. Like you just do one thing here and do another thing there. Yeah. So, like not don't take your schedules too seriously. I've been pretty blown away by the amount of stuff that you've been able to put out like on Instagram, the amount of art you're able to do while also producing this series <laughs> and learning, learning all the new skills for it. Uh, mm, the secret is to have no life <laughs> beyond your work. Uh, so this is a, another uh, burning personal question of mine. Uh, has oh. there been any progress on the possibility of a trimming plushie? And I, I have written here in my notes, <laughs> I am dying to purchase all of them so that I can swim in the meat monkey sea. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that everyone's been asking and i've been trying to work on it for okay. as soon as i released like the trimming video in the documentary i'm like this would be amazing as a plush yeah seriously i see your calls people i see it <laughs> i also really just i i always love to hear about 
what interests the creators that inspire me. Um, so these are like a few questions on some like slightly more personal, like, you know, surface level stuff, um, just about you as a person and like the things that you like. Uh, Ooh. you have a favorite game? Minecraft. Minecraft. I, I think for 80% of the time that I've had you added as a friend on discord, you have been in Minecraft. <laughs> Like in the Discord servers that I'm on, mm -hmm. some people are like, "Hey, is uh, is Darian okay?" And they <laughs> post a screenshot like Darian has been playing Minecraft for 13 hours. <laughs> Don't worry, it's just I'm just AFK. It's fine. What do you like to do in it? I play Skyblock most of the time. Okay, gotcha. Like I don't have any. I don't play any other games. It's only Mike. Wow. <laughs> if you were gonna pick any game to do that with, there's really not a whole lot of stuff that would fit the bill better than Minecraft. If it works, it works. How about like a favorite movie or TV show? A uh, favorite movie, uh, Annihilation from Oh, nice. 2000, 2018. Yeah, my wife and I just uh, watched that earlier this year. It's pretty good. Uh huh. I love just the the art in it. It's got that whole thing of, yeah, the stuff you're looking at is horrific a lot of the time, but also like- It's also it's, beautiful. Yeah, exactly. I especially like the deeper meanings behind the movie as well. They explore like specific topics and deeper stuff like self-destruction and creation. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely like, I got finished with it and I was like, ooh, I gotta think about that one for a while. <laughs> Um, Media that always makes you think after is awesome. Uh-huh. Yeah, for sure. Finally, uh, what sort of music do you listen to? Well, this is one of the hardest questions <laughs> to answer because <laughs> I don't really listen to much music either. But I also <laughs> listen to a lot of music. Is it like um, you listen to a very small scope of stuff, but a lot of it like on repeat, basically? I listen to a lot of things and only little nitpicks here and there. Gotcha. Okay. Like video game soundtracks and ambient music uh, most yeah. of the time. I've gotten, Nothing like main, like made by specific musicians and such. From there, I thought it'd be fun to do basically like a, a quick 10 question lightning round. Oh boy. So, uh, there's no wrong answers. Just kind of go with your initial gut response. You ready? I believe so. Okay, here we go. What's your favorite analog horror series? Uh, gotta be Mandela Kylo currently. Which Carnies is the best dancer? I would definitely say the trimming. Which Carnies tastes the best? I would definitely say the crawl. Are you secretly a mimic in real life? No. Are you the prince? No. Are you a trimming? Nah. Dang. I thought I thought we were gonna get you on one of those, but are the events of Vita Carnis real and being covered up by the Canadian government? No. Not in this world. Sure. Is flavor enhancer actually required for every meal? Oh definitely. Is it actually super tasty? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> and finally, which of the carnies is your personal favorite? definitely the trimming yeah well that's the that's the end of the lightning round so uh Yay. give yourself a, a pat on the back <laughs> i also put out a community post to see if any of my viewers had questions uh i also got permission from our friend manaxa to cover some of his community's questions um he said that they Ooh. were they were still flooding in after your guys's interview so he was like you know go ahead and uh see if you can fit a few of those in there as well the first uh, from uh, my post is, what do the carnies taste like? This is a, such a frequently asked question. <laughs> <laughs> Even I wondered myself. <laughs> I believe I've covered this uh, in <laughs> Minax's uh, interview as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so how the order goes is crawl would taste like liver. Okay. Trimming would taste like rabbit or raccoon okay definitely eaten both of those meat snake would taste fucking horrendous <laughs> the combination of rotting meat and vinegar Ugh. mixed together makes a nice good old stanky stew 
I'm getting hungry. I'm getting hungry over here. <laughs> Mimic would taste really gamey because of how much it moves, but okay. it would also taste a bit like human. So that yeah, that's <laughs> it. What's so well with that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Harvesters would taste really rubbery, like squid. Okay. Hosts would taste very fibrous, like organs or other tissue. We're talking okay. Okay, so not like mini weights. <laughs> no, definitely not. Okay. Not that kind of fiber. <laughs> not not like old person fiber, but like the physical structure fiber. <laughs> yeah, like like plant fiber, but meat. Gotcha. Like eating the husk yeah. of a coconut. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And the monolith would taste fairly similar to crawl. And the singularity would be like like licking like a, a rock. Okay. <laughs> it's not like a big jawbreaker. <laughs> no, no, it's like licking a window. Okay. <laughs> will we ever get to learn the true origins of the Udicarnus, or will it remain forever a mystery? You'll learn eventually. Okay. Uh, will we ever get more information on the Elder Mimics? Yes. Does every Carnies have an Elder variant? No comment. All right. Um, what is the biggest advice you have for someone who's looking to create a world that incorporates elements of body horror? Uh, research. Do your planning. Look up as much as you can. Okay. All information will help. What kind of tropes in the, the body horror niche do you think have been overdone? What do you think? Uh, what do you wish that people would explore more? Um... It's, nothing's really been overdone. Okay. I would say the most notable thing would be like the simple, very pale creature. Yeah. Tall man, long distorted arm. face. <laughs> yep, long, long features, very pale, messed up face. Gotcha. It's been used almost everywhere. So I'd say exploring other types of creature design would be pretty cool. Yeah. Mm hmm. I uh, unfortunately fall victim to that if you look at my <laughs> Instagram account. Oh, very pale creature with very gross face. Wow. You've got some stuff on there that's really great, though. Like, there, you've got some... A lot of the, the teeth stuff really bothers me. I don't know why. And to build on that, how about with, with analog horror? Where would you suggest that a, an inspiring, uh, aspiring creator begins? Uh, I'd say the same thing with uh, do your research and planning, but also try to do something new. Okay. Because if everyone does the same thing, it'll blend in. But if you try something else, ooh, you'll stand out. Yeah, you might get the next Vita Carnus. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? It could be like the biggest thing that happens. That's true. Yeah, I mean, even like with like the back rooms, like that was him coming into something that was already like pretty well established and being like i'm just gonna like take the skin Let's of it expand on that yeah. and like do something new with it and it became bigger than like the original thing yeah but another thing don't be afraid to do stuff that's already been done before there's nothing wrong with doing something that works yeah as they say all the best art is steel <laughs> yes um are there any horror creators that you watch on youtube uh there's a few I'd say like some the biggest analog horrors as of now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Walton Files, Mandela, Gemini, Local 58. Gotcha. Um, do you watch in much like analysis content or is it mostly like the people who are putting out the actual like the things that people are reacting to and stuff like that? I like to do a combination of both. Because okay. I like to get my first-hand experience and then, oh, I want to see what everyone else thinks. Uh -huh. I want to see what their theories are. Yeah, yeah. Do the creatures in Vita Carnus represent your own fear of something, or are they simply monsters that you thought others would find scary? Uh, They don't represent things that I fear, but the the entirety of Vita Carnus does represent something I do fear. Okay. Interesting. Huh. That's That's honestly not the answer that I would have expected. Um, I guess I was, I was guessing something more along the lines of kind of what I was talking about earlier. Like each one kind of appeals to somebody different. Um, and I thought that would be more of your perspective going in that idea of like everything all together 
in the end will represent a, a specific fear of yours. That's really interesting to me. What are some things that you don't like about your series? Oh, there's a lot. <laughs> um, when I first started is the lack of planning that I did. Gotcha. Like I didn't put like, it was just so nonchalant. I'm like, Hmm, this will be fun. And I just did it with, which is all right, but it could have been so much better if I just put the time into it. For example, mm -hmm. like my least favorite episode is the mimic instruction tape. Yeah. Because it took around one month to make that, but it also was being worked along with the meat snake video before that. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Because I wanted to put it out on Halloween, which in the end, it didn't even matter. Mm hmm. If I spend a little bit more time on that, I feel like the quality would have been a lot better. Yeah. I, I don't think that I personally picked up on any of the kind of gripes that some people did until maybe I'd watched through that video like three times. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess the kind of like the proportions of the suit maybe are a little different from like the drawings um, just yeah. because, you know, a person doesn't have the same proportions as a mimic. I guess like in retro uh in hindsight i can i can see what people are talking about but like i really never thought it was as bad as a lot of people made it out to be um it never really bothered me it bothers me a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can never like if people make analysis videos they're like oh they're talking about this scene skip 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 <laughs> such shame i brought to myself uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh yeah but yeah I Hindsight's 2020, though, so... Mm -hmm. The only thing that ever bothered me with the series was the green onions on the cutting board covered <laughs> in meat juice. That was on purpose. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Oh, man. Dude, that <laughs> the comments on that video crack me up. contamination no! They are so funny. <laughs> um, he missed the water. I was so bad at pouring. Uh, but yeah, the, the dude, smoke is fake. I absolutely love that video. <laughs> like for <laughs> for every single element of it, the way that it fits into the story, and like little ways that it's like fun to kind of like goof on it that were intentional in the end. I love that video. That one's like a big thing that represents part of what I love about the series, uh, which is just that the fact that like. Not every moment of the entire series is directed at fear. Yeah, like it's absurd. There's like meat. Of course, we're going to capitalize on it. Uh huh. Yeah, I've got just a few more questions and then I will release you from my basement, <laughs> depending on your answers. I've been following you on Instagram for a few months now, and I got to be honest, you post some pretty horrible stuff. <laughs> How did your interest in drawing body horror originate? And what keeps you driven to keep working in that niche? Uh, ever since I was little, I've enjoyed drawing like monsters and creatures. Mm -hmm. So in growing up, I didn't really get to see some of like the more scary stuff. I'm like when like when I'm looking up like references for drawing, I'd always find like the, the classic thing. Like, how do you draw scary eyes? And then when you go to images, yeah. You're like you see like realistic eyes with like hands and faces in it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I want to see what it looks like when it's gross. <laughs> yeah. I want to see what happens when it's like decomposing. And if I do that, I'll probably get put on a list. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so I'm like, hmm, what if I do that? So yeah. then I did. Mm -hmm. That was one of your first like big successful videos on YouTube, wasn't it? Like one of your drawing tutorials. It was the first video I yeah. ever did. Nice. Yeah. It was the first time making any sort of video. I'm like, hmm, I'll <laughs> put out a tutorial. Yeah. I mean, there's a kind of a natural inclination to like go to YouTube when you want to teach something like when when you're good at something and you're like, I want to make this available to other people so that, you know, I can kind of like help build this thing that I care about. What keeps you driven to keep making stuff in that niche? Have you ever thought about oh. like branching out or like, you know, what keeps you on the, the body horror train? <laughs> I I don't think I'll ever branch out like I might in the future, but mm -hmm. as it currently stands, not really. Yeah, I just really like 
drawing spooky, scary guys. Yeah, I mean, you're great at it, so it makes sense. Yeah, and that too. Mm -hmm. If it ain't broke. Yeah, I mean, when you when you found something that's working for you, like it makes sense to to stick with it and to like you've got room to grow in that. It's not like I mean, you know better than I do as you get better at something, you become more aware of the opportunities for growth that you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can even, you know, looking at the stuff that you have posted recently and like comparing it to the stuff that you posted, like when I started following you, it's like, you know, you can see progress there and it's really impressive. Are there any major details that fans have missed in the first season of Vita Carnus? And if so, where should we start digging? Um, so nothing super major. Everyone's been actually very good at catching details. Like mm -hmm. for when the finale came out. Yeah. Like I was surprised so many people found that little secret thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like as when I came back to it, I'm like, what? How is there already like a thousand people here? <laughs> how? Yeah. I don't understand. It was like three frames, man. Uh huh. But then again, I have conditioned everyone to look at frames. So. That is true. Yeah. I would say there's only like a few little things that people have missed and technically one considerably i wouldn't say major but something important well not important but something there yeah just something that you haven't seen anybody bring up yet but it's uh, like some people have brought up but they haven't figured it out okay gotcha i think i know i know you... minaxa was fucking <laughs> suffering yeah trying to look for it yeah he was he was uh expressing his his pains about this to me <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna have to dig in and and see what i can do <laughs> as well maybe uh maybe we'll get the chance to to see me suffer as well good, good. <laughs> so i've got one last question for you but first i want to turn things over to you for a second so that you can you know let people know where the best place to follow you and get connected with your work is and if you want to you know shout anybody out or anything like that you know now's now's your time okay so oh, hello my main platform is instagram i post most of my stuff there either art or updates on my stories i have the twitter i also have a kofi go like if you want to support my work yeah, go there <laughs> um and of course youtube can't miss that. Well, you're important. on YouTube. Wow, yeah, I, surprising, I know. Wow. And of course, go go down below the video of this one and go subscribe right now. This is a pretty talented work here that I'm surprised hasn't gotten better. Go subscribe <laughs> to Chromudgeon. Hey, do it. Well, thank you. Do it. <laughs> I uh, I appreciate that. And so here we are at our final question. Are you ready? I'm ready. I, I had to I had to channel my inner my inner hot ones for this for this interview question. What is the best color in Magic the Gathering and why? I am a green black guy. I like green especially. So yes. Gotcha. Green. So big big stuff. Mm hmm Big dumb creature. Of course. <laughs> of course I'm that one, huh? <laughs> hey, I didn't say that. <laughs> You said no, that. I'm saying that. I'm saying oh, okay, gotcha. I like big dumb creature. Of course I love big dumb creature. I guess I could see that. I mean, that's like the nature stuff kind of plays in with the uh, the carnies as well. Um, I'm also a control guy. Blue, white for the that, win. Actually, now that you now that you say that, like that is pretty much what the carnies would be is green, black, mm -hmm. little nature monsters. <laughs> that's literally everything I had. Once again. Thank you so much for agreeing to do the interview. And no once problem. again, congratulations on finishing up season one. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for having me on here as well. Yeah, of course. I mean, like I said, it was crazy exciting to get to have this opportunity and just get to learn a little bit more about the series and particularly to get to, to share that with other people. Having the chance to have you here on the channel is absolutely a blessing and really, really great to get to have a, a conversation with you and to share it with people. I know that we are all very excited to see what season two has to offer, assuming that there are mimic waifus. Nah. 
Hey, if you enjoyed this interview and are hungry for more, go check out my friend Minax's channel. He also did an interview with Darian, and they covered some different topics than we did. He's also just a cool guy all around and has a new V to Carnus video coming out soon. Go check it out. Of course, if you haven't seen my explanation video on Vita Carnus yet, I'd also recommend checking that out. I'm Chromudgeon. Thanks for watching.